I would like to start very early on. Um, what impact did punk in 1976 have on you? Um, from a career point of view. It no, was... from a personal point of view, what you as Gary Webb probably at the time, um, what impact had punk on you as a kid? Um, it, 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 it had a big impact in, in that it seemed to open doors. I was very, very ambitious even, even at that age and I knew what, what I wanted to do. And punk came along and I wasn't massively keen on it musically. I, I really like the Sex Pistols actually, but they were much sort of kind of slower, more standard. But um, it, what it did in terms of the interest that it generated and what it did for the music business was huge. And it seemed as though on every street corner in every city in, in England there, there were new record companies being set up and it was much more of um it went right down to sort of grassroots level it, it was it was very exciting but but it was more because I had my like a career brain approach to it and I, and I could see opportunities opening up that were not there before I'd, I tried to think of going around various record companies with your demo tapes and, and mostly it was quite intimidating big plush offices and people were kind of not they're not very nice really yeah um, and then the punk thing came along and it was like people doing it for themselves it, it was a much more exciting sort of atmosphere really and it felt as if it a lot more was possible so I found it really really exciting but not because of the music because of what I thought I could I could do with it as an opportunity Thing, all right. Yeah, I, I, I thought you would <laughs> like to say something <laughs> from the back. Okay, no. Um, well, to make to make it a little bit shorter, what uh, what when was the moment when the punk was dead for you? <laughs> Seventy late seventy seven. Punk died for me. Really, I, I I'd played in a punk band. I got whatever gigs I could get. Got myself a record contract with you know the best person of those that were interested and there wasn't that many even with all the opportunities um put out um one punk single was made to put out a second one not that i really wanted to and then i was then i was done with it uh, at that time i didn't know what else i wanted to do but i i could already see signs that punk had had its moment and it was fading away and i didn't want to be recognized or associated as a punk band even a relatively unknown one but i didn't want to hit have any real association to it so I wanted to separate myself from it as quickly as possible but a record company had signed me as their sort of token punky pop band um, so they were keen to have me stay there for a bit um, so it was it was difficult actually you know it's these things come and go and if you just get known as a punk band and as it dies most of those bands would tend to die with it and I wanted to move away from that which is probably being overly cautious really considering I was completely unknown, <laughs> nobody would know me as anything, but I was thinking that way. Did you have a plan how to, to get away from the punk thing? Um, I, I, it all happened very, very quickly, so you know, wanting to get away from punk, I can't honestly say that I, I had a master plan initially, but while I was in that process of still trying to argue with the record company about what I wanted to do next, and, with, and I didn't have a good argument, because I didn't really know what I wanted to do next, I just knew it wasn't punk um they put me into a studio to record the demos that i've been playing live which were punky kind of things so um carried on with that but while i was there um when i arrived there at this particular studio there was a synthesizer in in the corner that had been left behind and um and they they said i could the, the studio said that i could use it until it was collected but a high company who luckily didn't turn up so i had it for the whole day and um and fell in love with it. It was for, for me that was the moment that, that, that changed everything. Just seeing it there, I had no idea how they worked. I'd never seen a, a real one before in in the flesh. And so I I converted sort of on the fly really all all of these punk songs into pseudo electronic. You know what was junk 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 now went on the on the synth. So it was very half-hearted, but it was my first step into it. Went back to the record company with that, and so now I've planned was beginning to form and that was my avenue if you like you know that was the thing I wanted to do because I really thought I, I it had a future and I wanted to go in that direction and that would take me away from punk and, and establish me as something else hopefully if it was successful and I hated it I, I didn't want it at all they wanted this punk album but luckily they were they were really 
at the time they were they didn't have any money so their budget for me was those three days in in that studio so when I went back with a different album to what they expected if they weren't happy with it there wasn't that much they could afford to do they couldn't send me back and make me do the other one because they, they'd run out of money so th the fact that they didn't have much money was actually a really good thing for me at that time and I was allowed to carry on and move more into electronic music yeah, gladly they didn't drop you from the label <laughs> no <laughs> they could have done that too oh. they could have done but I think at that point because they were so um they only, I think they only had four or five bands, which is all they could afford. And any money that they put into any one of them, they really needed to see something come back if they were going to expand at all. So the idea of picking people up and dropping them and losing money on all their bands wasn't, wasn't their thinking. So although there was a big argument about moving to the electronic field, um, there were two directors at the time. One of them was really against it, and we nearly had a, a bit of a biff up in, the, in his office. And... Um, the other man was kind of it might it might not be interesting he was kind of prepared to go with it so that was good enough and that kept me on the label and it allowed me to move forward in that direction now did you feel then post-punky in a way or did, did you know, uh, the, the term post-punk um, appeared like um, immediately after punk was dead everything was post-punk so well i, rem I like remember that? everyone started calling it new wave for a bit, but now these these names kind of fly around a lot, and it depends what country you're in. You know, New Wave in America meant something quite quite different, and, it, and then again, punk encapsulated all kinds of stuff like the Stranglers and Elvis Costello. <laughs> I don't remember that being too punky, but it all got. I think even Eddie and the Hot Rods was called punk at one point. It just all got pulled into this umbrella. You know, if you wasn't Yes or Deep Purple or some one of that lot, and you were relatively young relatively, compared to the Stranglers, then um, you were punk-ish, or punk. Okay. And did you have any uh, experiences with uh, electronic music before that day in the studio? Um, I mean, did you notice electronic bands before, or bands that used the synthesizer? The only thing I'd noticed about electronic music before had been um, Crawford, obviously, who, who were kind of up there as a, as a, a yardstick, really. Um, and very little else. I've been to see Human League once or twice, um, but not not really. I wasn't aware of any sort of movement going on before I found it. And then when I found the synthesizer, my interest was massively into that. And I started to look around and, and found that there was quite a lot, actually, quite a lot of people but kind of all in isolation. You know, Daniel Miller was doing his thing, and OMD, and, and God, who else? Fad Gadget, and Human League, obviously. So there, there were, another, each city kind of seemed to have its own um, little thing. Um, the one that I really picked up on was Ultravox, when John Fox was the singer. Um, I, I thought they were way ahead of anybody else, and me. Uh, they, were, they were way ahead of me, I mean, not. Um, I, I just thought they, again, again for, for what I wanted to do, which wasn't the craft work route, which was you know to be completely electronic, completely te technology driven, I, I actually quite liked guitar and drums, and I wanted to add synthesizers and electronics to that. Um, so uh, uh, less radical, I guess, than what craft work were doing. But the, the people that were doing it best, um, in my opinion, at that time, were were Ultravox, and uh, I was really really impressed by them. So. I, I kind of took that as a bit of a blueprint, really, and followed along. You saw them also live? I saw Ultravox live several times, yeah. Um, I'm not sure how many now, but four or five, maybe six times. Whenever they played in London, I, I would go and see them um, regularly until my own thing um, sort of took off, and then it, it didn't work out many times, but, but as, yeah, as often as I could. Okay, and... What did you find interesting in the band? Was it only the music or the how they appeared? Uh, what yeah, attracted you? Um, but the, I thought the music was brilliant, uh, and and their mix of instrumentation with the electronics was fantastic. You know, a regular lineup, but with a violin and with uh, amazing keyboard sounds. Um, again, you know, I wasn't getting sounds as good as that in my in my opinion, and I and I really sort of wanted to. In fact, when I first toured, uh, Archer Fox was split up, and I got. Billy Curry to be in my band and I was just trying to learn all the time what, what he was doing it was, it was quite impressive but the thing that I was really most fascinated by with Ultravox was, was John Fox 
the, the, uh, the, the front man. Uh, it's just very um, enigmatic, right? fascinating to watch. And uh, a good lesson, really, I thought, for me in, in how you, you can be a front man without talking to death in between each song and just being boring. Just got up there, did it. Weird looking man, just in a good way. It's just brilliant, you know. Oh, I, I thought it was, I honestly thought that he would be a massive, massive pop star, but it kind of just never really worked. And that became you then. <laughs> yeah, in, in a way, yeah. Maybe. But it, it was, it was, it was great. You know, it had all the, just the right balance of m mystery, but yeah, it's cool. It's cool. Paul Humphreys told me yesterday that in pre midi days, I mean, you have, there were no presets, so in between each song there was a long pause. What, what, did, was it the same for you? Uh, when, when I got around that by by having lots of keyboards, we had 22 on stage on the first night of touring. I had two dedicated keyboard players a guitar player that also had a keyboard set up, I had a small keyboard set up, and I think even the drummer had one or two at one, at one point. And, and that gets you around the problem of having to have needing presets. You would have each machine set to a different sound, and, and you would just work around them. I think we had five or six mini moogs and five or six poly moogs and, and various other bits and pieces. Because uh, you couldn't, as you can, you can just press a button and, and, it, and everything changes, you know. So. I didn't want big pauses between songs, and I didn't want to talk between songs either. I'm not particularly entertaining in that sense. I feel I get really nervous talking to talking to the crowd, so I normally just say hello and thank you, and I'm off. Don't say much. So the idea of keeping it moving and keeping the music bang, 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 one song after another, and even some songs dovetail into another, it's a constant piece of music, took away the, the awkwardness that I felt in, in those moments between songs where you're kind of expected to say something witty. I've got nothing to say, <laughs> witty. So, um, but it worked. You know, it, it 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 was it was good. We didn't have any big pauses. Yeah. Paul had Andy McCluskey for the talking part <laughs> in OMD. Well, I, I on my first tour, the one that I had Billy Carey in the band. I do with a support band for that, and uh, they used to have a tape recorder. I think they called it Winston. They had a name for it, and they would introduce it on stage. They didn't try to hide it and pretend it was live, you know, that two of them were doing their thing and they had this tape recorder on a little podium in the middle. And so I don't I don't remember them having long pauses, I mean, it's because it, the tape recorder was doing half of it. How did you get aware of OMD, by the way, by that time? How did I get on with them? No, how did you get uh, aware of them? Um, how did you notice them? Um, I actually can't remember, to be honest, but it, it almost certainly because when I was looking around to find out who else was doing electronic music. Um, I think they were Liverpool based and and they would have come up in, in sort of my searches of sort of record stores and just talking to people and you know who's around that's doing this sort of thing and you know getting hold of stuff. It was for me at the time it became a, a bit of an obsession to find out who there was and what they were doing and because I'd, I'd only just come across them you know I really didn't know what they could do. Every day I was finding new things out about the, the machines and so we, to, to listen to what other people were doing was, was a bit like going to school you, know, you could find out you know, oh god I didn't know we could do that and, and it would just take you off in different directions and so you learn quickly you know rather you can't do it all on yourself you know every time you hear someone else has got a good idea it helps you to to develop your own ideas you know so um at that time it was really really uh, useful to, to, to me to, to find all these different people. I, I asked Daniel Miller to do the support, first of all, and I spoke to him on the phone and he couldn't do it because I think he was setting up mute or something, um, which obviously worked out quite well for him. So um, uh, then, then I heard about our Christian Maneuvers and listened to, uh, they had a song called Electricity, I think. Um, heard that and thought that was great. And they were small, you know, just two men so getting them on stage and off the stage is going to be quite quick because I had a big massive light show and I couldn't really be having a, a, a big band supporting me because it would have taken too long and there wasn't much space um, after my stuff had all gone there wasn't much space left for them um, so the idea of having a little two piece and I said that if they did, didn't have any money you know, they could travel with me on the bus and we could put their gear in, in my trucks and you know, it would be easy you know. so um, they, were, they were perfect for it and it turned out they were really good, and, and the audience loved them as well. So the, the whole thing just worked brilliantly. Um, now you first started 
as a guitar player uh, in, your, in your punky days. Yeah. Um, what was the? It's, uh, it's a little bit different for me to to ask this in, in English. What was the difference of a kind of in sort of feeling when you stay on a stage with, uh, when you're on stage with playing a guitar, holding it in your hand? Um, you know. It's a more macho instrument. It's yeah. very male, and you can say it's like fa a little bit phallic. Also, you know, you have this dick in your hand, uh, <laughs> and yeah. on the other hand, you have these keyboards that have a total different, um, how do you say, connotation. Or something. Yeah. Uh, how did that change feel for you? Uh, did, what, did you did reflect on that in any way? The it, the difference between playing guitar and playing keyboards. Um, Is is massive actually. I mean, it's, they're, they're probably completely opposite ends of the spectrum. The guitar is it's a sexy instrument to, to play. You know, you you can you can move with it and roll, roll around it. It is phallic, um, and it's just got. You can just do every cliched shape in the world. You know, the, all that stuff. It's just brilliant. <laughs> I love all that. Don't care how long it's been around, and it's just and it's a lovely thing to to play. You know, it's it's. Loud, it's, you know, it's very powerful, and you hit the big chords, and you hear it, and feel the sound sometimes, and it just looks good. You know, it's it's quite. I've seen some people manage it, but it's quite hard not to look pretty cool playing the guitar. But some people manage to not look cool quite well. But generally speaking, most people look pretty cool playing the guitar. So you know, it's this kind of good thing to get on stage with keyboards. It's really hard to look cool playing a keyboard. You just look like a a nerd all the time so being aware of that I decided that I wasn't going to play keyboard which is so I, I increased the band I had two players um, dedicated to keyboards and then other people could play a little bit pieces I would play a little bit in the early days um, I, I very rarely do that at all now so if I play anything it's just just a guitar but in those days I would play keyboards on, on a few songs because I thought people probably expect me to really and would want to sit because I'm You're supposed to be this electronic thing, so I'd you know play a little bit here and there, but it's a bit boring, really. You know, you, you know, fever, you, you can't get into it. I thought I have uh, the not the new one, but um, a few bands ago of the, the Nine Inch Nails lineup, uh, he had a brilliant setup, and it was on a spring or something. A Manson's man had his on a kind of, I don't know, like a swing that way. Um, a brilliant, you know, that. that We gave a slightly different perspective to it, but you're still relatively static. You, you can't move around the stage too much. You're kind of fixed in a position, unless you've got one of those things that you put around your neck. And yeah, you know. <laughs> that was really the low point. Keyboard <laughs> 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 guitars. Yeah. Oh my god. It's just not good, is it? <laughs> so uh, if you didn't want to go that route. You you um you got someone else to play them and just sang up the front and I wanted to be a front man anyway and you know, as my I didn't have much confidence but as I did it more and more my confidence grew and grew I became far more comfortable just singing and knowing what to do with my hands during the songs which initially you just, they just feel like this horrible thing stuck in your arms and you you don't know what to do with them I used to practice at home what to do with my arms horrible really wooden and awkward and clumsy but you get you know you you get past that i guess but the wow. key no no one play keyboards on stage ever <laughs> but i saw uh, on youtube your performance and it irked the, the movie no yeah. um and it was uh down in the park i think oh in a little what car what the hell did yeah. you think about cruising around in this electro coffin <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a wheelchair it was a wheelchair under that and i had kind of a spacey type of top of it yeah yeah a bit spinal tap Looking back on it, seemed good at the time though. <laughs> I just got like that, actually. I know, I know. Give me a rest. It was just trying to make the shows to give people something to look at. You know, there'd been a as I was growing up, there was a a long history of very spectacular shows um, that I went to see. You know, Bowie and all these people were doing most amazing things, uh, and I grew up thinking that that's what you did, and that was, you know, the the pleasure if you like of you know being successful and getting onto big stages you can have these monstrous great stage sets and just you know it wasn't just a gig going to see people play songs it was a spectacle everything about it you know 
even to this day when I write songs, I think about how they will look live and will even change certain lines knowing that there would be something that you could do that will work visually with that particular line. It's never been just about singing songs, you know. So that was I was I was attempting to make them spectacles. And some of it was all right. And some of it <laughs> some of it not so good. But on the other hand, keyboards and synthesizers were the perfect vehicle for your for your songs, I guess. Or am I I mean yes the um how do you say the topics in your songs it's always uh, the words alienation and disconnection or falling always um, it wouldn't have worked probably with a guitar band in that way i think it it gives you this this the keyboard is also represents this distant or disconnection a little bit better for me i think it's a coincidence um i think it's tr it's true but i think it's a coincidence that for me to be able to sit at home w with a machine that, that does a, a massively varied array of noises compared to a guitar which are fairly limited to just one or whatever pedal you plug into you sort of gets a bit fuzzy or it doesn't or it sort of has a bit of an echo or it doesn't that's pretty much it you know so you're kind of limited by that um and i've I'm, i've always been far more interested in in sound than i have in technique you know i'm not interested in if you can just press one key on a keyboard and, and all this stuff you pr program it in obviously but all these different things slowly happen you know the sound itself is amazing it's constantly changing not just like a tone i don't, I don't mean that but you know with these atmosphere type things that you can have now are just amazingly evolving stuff it wasn't so easy to do in those days but you know it was, it was still possible up to a point and i was blown away by that and, and and it was that the ability to sit at home making noises and and sounds and atmospheres creating atmospheres um which i found more interesting than you know sitting down with a guitar for two or three hours a day trying to do that whittling as my wife calls it <laughs> whittling hate that never been interested no, never been interested to be honest in becoming a really good player ever you know i still to this day don't know the names of chords I write songs by seeing if that sounds right or it doesn't. Where somebody that knows what they're doing would know that that wouldn't work with that because they understand music. I've got no idea. You know, oh, no, that doesn't because it sounds wrong. Oh, that's all right. Yeah, I like that one. And I just stumble along and, and I've never bothered to, to learn how to do it properly because the way I do works for me and I've never needed to. No, but every once in a while it's embarrassing. But generally speaking, I, I I get away with it, you know. Yeah, but that's I think the general approach of the punk generation. To, to you don't have to be uh, some you don't have to have virtuosity, you know. Mm. Just do whatever you like to do and, and feel free to to experiment. I think it's because you're you know I, I honestly believe that that given the right sound, one note is often all you need. You know, it can correct, it can convey. If you take a film, um, you know, where there's a fairly heavy moment that might be frightening, you just hear one deep rumble in the background, and there's, there's a sense of menace or you know, uncertainty comes from that. It's just one note, you don't need all this stuff. So, if, you, if your interest in music is more sound orientated than it is all that, then there isn't that sort of driving need, if you like, to, to want to learn all, all that because you don't, you're never going to put that in your songs anyway. So my interest was less and less in playing and more in this and buttons and, wow, that's, you know, that's amazing and, and just trying to get sounds that were exciting. I got excited by a new sound, you know, so I was constantly buying new bits of kit to find out what it did and coming to grips with programming, the different kinds of programming for various synthesis um, systems that come along over the years and still am up to a point even now I still find that the most exciting part of it. Okay. Now as we talk about it what what did you think at the time of bands like um, of those typical rock bands like for example Styx or Early Foreigner or even someone like Bruce Springsteen typical rock act what was that for you at the time? No I hated it still do actually you don't touch me at all emotionally and musically. 
I'm not against it, you know, if people love it and cool, but for me, no, nothing, nothing. There's not one molecule in my body that goes, oh, that's good. None of it. I can't, don't get it at all. The whole Bon Jovi thing, and, you know, I know they do stadiums and all that, so I'm obviously wrong, but for me, no, not interested. Only the mu uh, music wise, or also the, the whole image, the whole thing they represent being. I don't really know what they. I for me, as when you started off, y your look, your image was totally non authentic. Uh, it represented everything to me like uh, it has to be artificial in a way, but not sweaty, uh, <laughs> of course, and no blue jeans, blue color rock. And uh, so, was that. By purpose, did you say, okay, I want to I wanna be totally against that? Or, or did you come up with your own image? I don't compared? think, no, I, I, nothing that I did was, was reacting against that. Um, but the fact that I, I had absolutely no interest in it whatsoever um, has to play a part. You know, because my thinking is completely different to that. And I'm not interested in you know, big hair and tight jeans and singing about being whatever they sing about, I don't know. Don't know. No, it's not, so I didn't do anything ever that was a reaction against something else. I just did what I was interested in and fascinated by. So I had no, um, I wasn't reflecting any kind of social feeling amongst young people or nothing like that at all. I was really selfish, I just did what I was interested in. and pursued music in a way that satisfied my interest in it as far as it went um, which sometimes wasn't that far you know some days I wasn't not bothered about it and other, other days it was everything so what was the idea behind your your early image um, on your first two albums well it um, the first one not much uh, the, the second one was where I started to get the image thing sorted out the album called replicas um, And at that point, you see, replicas came from a series of short stories that I was writing, and I had loads, um, all based on a, on a theme, like a science fiction kind of thing, about what I thought London might become in 30, 40, 50 years' time, whatever. And that was all based on, I, there were some stories in the newspapers when I was young about um, gangs that were going on the underground, leaping off at platforms, beating up anyone that was there, and jumping back on a train and disappearing. And... Um, My first band was called Tube My Army, and it's all come from this news article that I, I read, um, which is where the short stories come from. Never finished those, started making the album, but converted those stories into songs, into a, a, a lyrical content. Most of the titles of the songs were chapter titles from the stories I was writing. Um, so it, 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 the way I looked what was a character from the stories I was writing, and it had nothing to do with any kind of social mirroring or reacting against um, you know the big rock bands at the time or nothing like that at all it was just a little sci-fi idea moved onto the stage the thing about not I didn't used to smile ever I mean, I did television or anything like that I never never smiled and um, that kind of got picked up on by the press here as, as you know this sort of moody bloke that never smiles and, but that's because I've got big teeth at the front I was just really embarrassed with my teeth, so I didn't smile. <laughs> and I wore makeup because I had spots. So the whole makeup thing was never actually part of it. The wearing the black clothes and having white hair and all that, that was all part of it because that was on the album cover. Um, but I, I never really meant to, to go the, the whole makeup thing and do all that you know, theatrical stuff. But I, I, you know, spots and I covered them up and put a bit of makeup on because I looked too white. And then I start reading that there's this, you know, sort of androgynous looking, moody sort of bloke. And it seemed to create a, made a bit of a mark with certain people and fans seem to be picking up on that more than anything. And and so it kind of, I, I developed it more, but it, it really wasn't, wasn't part of any great plan at all. Yeah, okay, but obviously it um, represented the zeitgeist Uh, of, the, of the time. I mean, Seemed other to, people yeah. like David Sylvian, for example, or David, David Bowie um, reinvented himself also. Um, this pale, uh, he had this uh, Pierrot look then, like yeah. from Ashes to Ashes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, 
Let me see. Uh, did you experience any trouble with your equipment, um, uh, technical trouble on stage? I mean, because of the they were not very reliable on the early synthesizers. And you remember any incident? On yeah. Stage? Oh, wait, what the fuck? Playing a regular rock and roll band. We have more trouble in that, on that first tour, particularly. Uh, we had so much technical trouble. It was it was ridiculous, actually. The, the, the very early synthesizers couldn't stay in tune for about five minutes. The mini moves, particular, were bad for it. I, I can't remember exactly what point it changed. I, I think it, used to be, it was like when the ten thousand serial numbers came out, but I can't remember for sure. Anyway, they sorted it. But you, you know, you would start a song and have it set up. But by the time you got to the end of the song, if it was more than about three or four four minutes, they were just drifting. The tuning was going feverishly, tuning up again for the next one. A nightmare, absolutely not. You would carry a person um, whose job was solely to keep them running during a gig. So one would go down, you'd plonk another one, because I had spares as well as 20 odd on stage at any one time. Plonk another one on, um, set to the sound that one was supposed to be on, take that runner back, and the the panels would be coming off of the unit with soldering irons and bodging them up and just trying to keep them all running. It was full-time job, just just to keep enough of them working to get through the gig. <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was a bit scary at the time. And the amount of weird noises that would suddenly come out of them because something had happened. That you press a key and this new big bass sound was supposed to happen. <laughs> you just go down, and that would be it. You ruin the moment, and you'd see people. Ripping this thing out of stage and trying to fix them again. Yeah, yeah. Good fun. <laughs> it was a good. It was actually good fun. Look, looking back on it, it was a laugh, but not so much at the time. Yeah, sure. Especially, I mean, as an artist, you really have a vision. You want you want to represent your music and and, and you want to show give the audience a good show also. Yeah. And, and uh, it's very difficult. Yeah, it's kind of kind of being let down a little bit. It wasn't. It wasn't. It it was bad, but it wasn't as if every song was ruined. Yeah, but on, a, on any particular night, you could sort of fairly guarantee four or five, maybe you know, maybe half a dozen moments that, that were not as they should have been, or weird, you know, suddenly weird noises would drift out from the back and you'll, you'll see things disappearing. So it, it didn't ruin the night, but it, it was something that you were constantly having to work at to keep, to keep the show running properly. Okay. Now, your success opened, a lot of door, opened up a lot of doors for other bands who use synthesizers, um, probably they got their record contracts because of your success um, or started to make music more in this direction. Hmm. Um, how did you feel about the, the other bands emerging at the time? Let's say really about 1979-1980, the first wave of bands, also may, maybe like Visage at the time uh, appeared, or, or Ultravox with Vienna, their album. Yeah. Um, was this, was it a more was there a rivalry or um, what was the feeling about those other bands? Well, but when when I had my success and um, you know, all the other bands started to become some of them that had been around became more well known because of it. Other bands were, were new and springing up because there was a new interest in electronic music. I, I I never had a problem with it at all. In fact, I used to make a point. Whenever any new electronic band sort of got into the chart, I would always write to them and say, you know, welcome to the world because it's you know it's going to be quite different to what you expect because that was my experience of it. You know, it, it had been a little bit more um, uh, scary than I, I thought it was going to be. Anyway, I, I tried to make friends with everybody as they come in because I, I I just felt that it, I took such a lot of um, hostility from the press and from people in the street that didn't like electronic music, that I, I kind of felt like an army of one. So when all these other people started coming out and all the various record companies was, were having their token electronic act, everyone would sign electronic act to try to cash in on what was happening. Um, it felt as if I, it was strengthening my side of things. And uh, I really wanted to make sure that we were all kind of together and as a unit. Uh, didn't work, to be honest. You know, everyone's got their own agendas and doing their own thing, so it's a bit disappointing. But I, I didn't see any of it as a, as a threat at all. I've always thought, you know, there were so many people in the world. You know, there are so many people buy records. It, it, it doesn't really matter if there's 20 electronic bands or a thousand of just 
on just one. You know, there are a number of people that will like that sort of music. And even if you're, you're not their favourite electronic act, they, they still like that kind of music. So there's still a good chance. Uh, you know, and it means you've got to stay on your toes and, you know, stay as good as you can be and keep working hard. And, um, I, I, I never had a problem with it. You, you know, the more that came along, the more electronic music became established, the better that was for me. I had, I mean, I had the musicians union tried to ban me when I first got to number one because he said I was putting musicians out of work. I had six people in my, I had more people in my band than anyone else on top of the pops when I did it, and yet I'm putting musicians out of work. Yeah, yeah. made no sense at all. Um, but for about two years they tried to to ban me. You know, which would have been catastrophic. You know, you've got things you can't do unless you're in the union. Um, hated that. So it it helped those kind of problems go away as well you know if there were two or three people in the top 10 doing electronic tracks and obviously i'm not the big bad boy anymore so it, it you know it fixed a lot of things it took a lot of the press hostility that was solely directed at me to begin with away didn't stop them being hostile but it, i didn't get quite as much of it um generally speaking it and the, it made me proud because it, it all of a sudden there was a scene that there was a a completely new kind of music it had its own category in, in record stores now you could go in there and there was an electronic music category and there had never been one before and and I was kind of the first one to get into the pop charts um, doing pop mu electronic pop music and um, I was sort of quite proud of that you know to being right right at the beginning um, so you know it, for me it was cool it was cool you know, you know the, the, the bigger it got the, the, the more I liked it. The so-called Blitz scene in London. Yeah. Have you ex uh, any experiences with the, with the Blitz Club or a, something surrounding the Blitz? No, I used to go to the Blitz Club regularly. Every, I don't know if it's weekly or monthly now. It's Steve Strange standing at the door deciding who was going to come in and who wasn't. And then I fell out with them because we did... Um, I had a single called our Friends Electric um, and it... I think when it got to number, it got to number one eventually for a while, and the week before it was number one week when it got to number two, I think. Uh, I took me and Billy Curry were part of the Blitz thing, uh, so we, we went down there with the band. And we were going to go in, and then Billy Curry, uh, Steve Strange said that he wouldn't let him in because he didn't look right, and I just thought, you tit, you know, what a wanker. So, um, so we didn't go in, and then the. Uh, Quite a long-lasting feud between me and Steve Strange kicked off, which is doubly annoying because Fade to Grey was written by my keyboard player and Billy Curry and my drummer during the during the sound checks for my first tour, and then when that's finished and Visage come out, my drummer is rode out of it completely, um, and it's called Toot City when they were doing it for various reasons, and it become called Fade to Grey, and Steve Strange gets involved and blah blah blah, and. Uh, I don't know, it just had a real bad taste for me for a long, long time. I'm over it now, mainly. <laughs> but, and then he tried to gate crash my own... I had a p party in, uh, after my first big London show when, when I got in 79, when I got famous. And who turns up at the door but Steve Strange trying to get in? I said, <laughs> fuck straight off. <laughs> Fucking... Oh. Now what was the Blitz Club like? <laughs> it was good fun, it was good. Really good, yeah. So it's a brilliantly cool-looking people, and it's just very vibey. And uh, really, I love the music. Used to play loads of really cool music. Um, it was a nice, you know, good part of London to be in. You didn't have to worry about getting beaten up going to it or getting home from it. It was, it was, uh, it was great. You know, right up until the time they he did that to me at the door. You know, he would let me and Billy in because we'd been there before. But he wouldn't let anyone else. I just thought it was. Ponzi, you know, trying to be like uh, that, um, is it Studio 21 or 27, whatever it's called in New York, trying to be like that, you know, being at the door and, you know, in, in charge of the, in charge of the style content, twat. Yeah. Anyway, so. Did you dress up also there or? Yeah, and I've been for years, um, uh, used to uh, dyed hair and all that sort of stuff. Um, from when I was about 14 onwards and there were very very few places you, you could go in London without getting in, into you know getting 
fights and things. So we used to go to gay clubs a lot. One in Poland Street, good Louisa's used to go to quite a bit, where the sex pistols used to hang out, and Susie and all that like that. So that was really cool. Um, some weird stuff, but it was in- interesting. Um, and then some clubs started to do um, various nights, you know, like early punk sort of thing. So you could go there and, and everyone there looked the same. There was lots of you, so you, you could kind of get in and out of that without too much trouble. But it was it was a bit, a bit iffy for a bit getting, getting to and from these places. Um, and then Blitz was fully established and it became a really cool place to go for anyone. You know, not that anyone could, could, could get in, but it kind of become accepted then to look that way and you know it was, it was um not as dangerous as it used to be seriously dangerous a year or two before now you remember a specific moment in, in the blitz where you think maybe this is too far out now for no no, or no like? i never no i, I never there's never enough going on that it was too weird N- never i never have seen anything that's been too weird it's all interesting all of it Seen some cool stuff <laughs> over the years. No, it's good. it wasn't that. But what, what are you going to do in a club? You know, chug some girl in the corner, or some boy upstairs or something. Yeah. See that in loads of clubs. <laughs> Go to well, torture garden. We're going to see some weird shit. Go to torture garden. That's much more interesting than Blitz ever was. The torture garden nowadays, or mm. what? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's more like a fetish club, or isn't it? Yeah, pretty yeah. much. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. Blitz was quite tame yeah. compared to that. It was just cool. It was just cool to see people, to be amongst people that were like-minded um, in terms of where they looked, uh, the music that they liked, you know, what they wanted to do. They didn't want to go out and get drunk and beat people up. They wanted to go out and look good and listen to music that they liked with no trouble. And it was just a nice, friendlier environment than many, many other places that you could go to. And it was, it was just nice to be amongst it. But it was also full of creativity, right? I think the, the it turned out that way. Yeah, but I, I, it, it, I, I, I often wonder whether these these places that just coincidentally end up with a fairly creative kind of group of people going amongst it, or whether it's those kind of people that do think differently that are always looking for someone like that where they can go and be amongst like-minded people. But yeah, as it turned out, um, a number of people that were in bands or in fashion or whatever, you know, creative people, ended up going through it at one point or another. Good for that. Okay, and what did you think of the whole gender bender thing that went on at the time, um, you know? Because it's also a reaction to this whole macho thing for me. It was, but then again, see, if you've been a Bowie fan, the gender bender thing had been going on since 72 anyway. You know, so, Again, it wasn't new. It, it, it had been around for a bit. It just became more acceptable, I think. You know, it, it had always been a bit freaky before, but I don't. It, it didn't feel that different to me. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd been a Barry fan for such a long time, and various offshoots of that, uh, where sort of makeup and dressing up and dyeing your hair and looking a bit odd. Uh, have been very much a part of that throughout most of my teenage years so come Blitz Club it's just uh, an extension of that really another another part of that the latest version of what you'd already been doing for a long time anyway as was punk in a way because a, a massive element of punk was a visual element of it you, know, you take the music aside it was still good interesting to look at Do you think there's a relation between the, the times, uh, which were really tough? I mean, there, there were a lot of workless people around, the economy was really down by, by the end of the 70s. Uh, that people partied really hard and dressed up and something that gives you kind of escape. It's interesting, I find that, because these sort of parallels are often drawn. Um, with times being hard and people getting more into music people are doing it again now I had a conversation with somebody yesterday that said um, that people are going to gigs more now than ever because you know they're worried about what's going on in a recession and all that I don't know if that's true or not to be honest if, it might be but you know, if you go back to to the punk days um, it became an expensive fashion you know it cost a lot of money to buy trousers that had drawing pins or safety pins in them rather drawing pins um, 
you know, you, if you wanted to buy a t-shirt for 20 quid and you wanted one that was ripped, it was like 30 quid, it was more. So, and you had to get them from the right shop. If you didn't buy them from Sexton, it wasn't real. It wasn't proper pump. You know, so all of a sudden it, be, it, it just became big business. So I don't know how much of it was people that didn't have any money trying to have a, have a good time because it cost them a bloody fortune just to dress up in the clothes in the first place. You couldn't just go home and rip, and rip your jeans. It wasn't, it wasn't acceptable. That had to be proper. <laughs> it's all just, just money making, really. Just a big exercise from a handful of clever people that got money out of everyone. So I don't honestly know I think that's why the people of, were there. That's the way things move always you have one you, somebody starts a trend or somebody starts to rip off the jeans and do it do it by himself mm -hmm. and it's uh, on some at some time uh, it's going to be an industrial thing it's going to be um, manufactured Freak. and Freak. Well, you think yeah. sex boosters and malcolm mclaren and that whole king's road sex shop thing was pretty much the sort of the, the nucleus of where it all exploded from well, that was there was ambition in there from the very from the very world go to do exactly that, you know, to create fashion, to create this, to create that, and, and make as much out of it as possible. Yeah, All under the guise of talked to Malcolm McLaren also on this occasion. I mean, plan, <laughs> man. everything has a, a, according to a plan, a commercial plan. Yeah, <laughs> but it's all done under the guise of being the voice of you know the common man, the poor man on the street who's having a hard time. And that'll be another 10 quid for your ripped t-shirt, please. Thank you very much. You know, it's just, it's all a con, really. Um, did, did you listen, uh, did you, um, I heard that Spandau Ballet started in the Blitz Club playing there as a kind of a regular band. Did you? I knew they were there. I didn't know they were a house band, but I knew they were there, yeah. But you never saw them playing there? I don't remember seeing them play, no. Well, after my little row with Steve Trent, I never went back, so. I was early blitz, I guess, because it went on for a long time after I stopped stopped going to it. Okay, have you been aware of bands like that were more in this kind of um, vein, like Spandau Ballet, early Duran Duran bands? That I think they were no real synth bands. Of course, they were more like I don't know. It sounded very funky to me in a way. Or they early. Yeah, it's different. It, they had a keyboard element to it, I think, but it wasn't electronic music as such, no. A whole new romantic thing. There was an ele there was an element of that which had the electronics in it, but it wasn't it wasn't dedicated to electronic music at all. So things like Duran Duran and Spandau were more conventional I guess in their sound. The new romantic tag, what was it for you? I got uh I got caught up in it, um but again simply because I was around at the time, really, and I for one period I had a suit on and a fedora hat so I kind of got called a new romantic but to me I was just having a career at the same time they were having a career I never really had that much interest in it I thought it looked cool but in a way yeah for a bit but I didn't really um, have that much interest in it really I mean it was I think it didn't catch up to the whole thing it, it tried to um, to cover it up with one word or I mean, two words, new romantic, but um, I don't know. I think it, there are too many different styles under this umbrella that, that won't, that won't um, fit to, to the word new romantic, because not every band has this freely shirts or whatever. No, um, yeah. it's very much a, an era-defining look, I think. It, it, it ties you into early, early 80s totally, and everything looks... A bit silly now. What did you think when Adamant came on? The, on the oh, I loved Adamant. I thought he was great. Um, I sent him a note saying welcome to the thing. Uh, one of the very few people that wrote back, and he, he came to the studio and hung out for a little bit, and uh, we just talked about how weird it is. You, you know, when you first become f famous, it's such a weird thing. It's so much happening. I mean, yeah, every single part of your life is changed. Um, some in a small way, mostly in a really, really big way. And you're kind of just in the middle of this blur of stuff going on and trying your best to just keep a handle on what's happening to you, you know. And uh, 
really, really weird. Anyways, we talked about that quite a lot because it had just happened to him, and I've been there for about a year, I think, year and a year or two. And um, so I'm, I'm almost what 22, and I felt like an old man talking to someone, some little boy. I think he's older than me. About about what it's like, and you know, how to get through it and all that. Although I was still struggling with it myself, but he was great. I really loved what he did a lot. I really did. He was probably my favourite of all of those people. You know, all of them. I, I thought he's brilliant. Actually, he's clumsy, man. He knocked over everything in the studio within about two hours. I think he'd broken almost everything in it. <laughs> spilt this, spilt that, smashed that, tipped that over. But lovely, good fun. It's a shame that he he he, he had a hard. He's had quite a hard time for for a bit. So it's a shame, but he was good. Yeah, speaking of hard times, I mean, in ni late 1981-82, the whole electronic synth pop thing was really on its, uh, at its peak. And even Kraftwerk had a huge hit with the model mm. in early 82. At that time you retired already, even, mm. if it's, uh, even if it was only for a short time. But what did you think at that time when all the other bands r had these huge successes and you were kind of, I, I don't know, burned out? Uh, yeah, it was more a survival thing for me really. It's, um, it's, it's, I, I did have a really, really bad time with the press. I've never ever been good with um, people. I've got this Asperger's thing, which means I interact badly, you know, clumsily. Um, so I find small talk really difficult and putting myself across and explaining what I mean. Um, I could often be way too blunt and I'm, I don't have the, um, sympathy is the wrong word, but I, I, I don't have a good feel for people and I misread facial expression all that sort of stuff anyway what it means is I, I tended to be quite reclusive and I, I found the the reaction of the public both those that liked me and those that didn't to be really weird and I, not what I expected at all and the hostility was really surprising because I just you've just written a song you know that a lot of people liked it's not like you've done anything wrong or hurt anybody or, or you know but there's you know people going to bash you and you know my car got damaged I had death threats and gonna cut my dog up oh, you know, real weird stuff you know and I'm only 21 and I'm quite an, a not a worldly 21 I'm a very I'm a home boy 21 you know nice mum and dad you know all that sort of stuff and so uh, all a bit shocking to me so I kind of just retreated and retreated from it more and more um, I'm at a time 1981 at the end of 1980 come along I'd only been about a year and a half I was freaked out by the whole thing at all, and I, and huge amount of pressure from record companies to keep churning out albums to get the money coming in, which I didn't want to do. I wanted, I wanted to develop my songwriting. I thought I had a lot to learn about writing songs. I still felt really clumsy, and, and even though a lot of them have been successful, I, I didn't feel particularly good at songwriting. I thought I'd just been lucky, and so I wanted to develop that. Um, I, I was really uncomfortable on stage. I, you know, I do big, massive shows, but my bit of it. I still felt really awkward and I wanted to kind of get away from that. And the thing about touring, touring kind of seemed to put you right in the f front of um, people's attention. You had know, the presser on your case and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so I thought, I, I just I wanted to slow it down. I wanted to get out of it, slow, stop that blurriness, slow everything down and try to understand what had happened and where I was and what this new life meant did I even want it? Because it really wasn't what I expected. And you have to learn what's good about it and, and how to avoid the bits that are not so good about it. But that takes time. And it's difficult to do that when you're, when you're gigging and playing and TVs and all that all the time. And you're really, really exciting, but really, really weird at the same time. And so I needed to calm everything down and just take stock of where I was. And that was the idea behind the retiring. And I never meant to retire from the business. I wanted to make more records and concentrate on the songwriting, but I wanted to stop touring. Um, and that got misreported so many times. You get fed up with saying, no, I don't mean, I just, you know. So I just, yeah, retiring for forever, I thought. Um, uh, I think it was a really good decision. I think it was a decision that stopped me being, you know, dead, 
drug addict or God knows what's going to happen. But you know, I was really in a state. Uh, so I think it's a really good decision, but very, very badly executed. You know, because I, I made a big fuss about it. I'm going to retire. You know, well, I shouldn't. Have, why? Why did I need to say all that? Should have just done it. You know, do a tour and then don't do any for a bit and see how things go. <laughs> I didn't have to say anything at all, but I did because I was 21 and whatever. And uh, yeah, so just couldn't have done a worse thing yeah, but at the, a more wrong time, really. The whole video clip concept would have been a good opportunity for you. Huh? You did, don't have to go on tour that much. You can yeah Let your visuals go out in the well that was my thought I, I honestly thought the video was going to replace live gigging anyway i really did and said so loads of time you know that the future of live performance is probably seeing you know at the end of its days i honestly thought video was going to um i just completely misunderstood the 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 whole event concept you know what it means for people to see to be with the person that they like and to actually be there and experience that with other people around them. I just didn't click with, with that at all. And that's got to be my Asperger's thing. You know, I, the Asperger's thing answers a whole load of problems for me that I, that I had all through my life up to that point. You know, difficulty making friends, blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. But, uh, and so uh, it's, it has, it has it's got some good things about it you know it gives you an obsessive tendency there's lots of things about it that are very useful to do this for a living um but there are some things about it which are really not helpful at all um and not understanding people is obviously a big one so and, and the other thing about video never what happened video you know video comes along and clips and all that sort of thing which seemed like a really good thing and it Everyone did it. Everyone made their videos soon after that, and live concerts and so on. But the whole market is fragmented, you know, with with digital television and you know Sky and all this sort of business. Um, there are now so many channels, each one catering for specific kinds of music, that it's fragmented the audience. In this country, before you would go on top of the pops, and everyone that was interested in music, well, of what, almost any kind, youth oriented music anyway, would watch it. You might only like one or two things on it, but you watched it because it was all you had. So massively powerful, massively powerful. And now, there really isn't anything like that. You know, if you're lucky, you'll get on a rock channel. So a few people will see that. You know, if you're really lucky, you'll get on two rock channels and a few people might, a few more people might see that. But it, it's, it's broken everything down into lots and lots of little chunks. And it's um, nowhere near as powerful as it, as it used to be. So it's, yeah, but back in the days you had to share the stage with Rolf Harris or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, that was Gary Newman. And now coming up next. Yeah, it's on true. Twenty-one <laughs> new entry. Yeah, yeah, that it did have totally its embarrassing. <laughs> sometimes I guess. Yeah, it could be. Could um, be. So a lot of bands uh, made a career in the early eighties on on videos. But there were those so-called haircut bands, um, um, like Duran Duran or Culture Club. Uh, what do you, do you think about them musically when when they were really huge? I was alright with Duran. I thought that was okay. Uh, I was never really a Culture Club fan, although I was a Boy George fan. I thought it was just the right sort of personality that the business needed. These people made the business, uh, the music scene, a lot more interesting and vibey than it had been before. Um, and so I was all in favour of it. You know, um, uh, musically, a lot of it wasn't really f for me you know but that didn't matter you know it's you wanted a music scene that had lots and lots of big characters in it uh and with a good variety of music uh, some of the you know the, a lot of the problems that music has had over the years um because radio is so important to it um radio tends to be the a and r department to a degree of or the music industry, you know, record companies have their A&R people, but they're only signing things that they know the radio will play. So it all, st it all goes back to people at radio, really, um, which is quite difficult. And, and it, it means that you, you have less and less variety you know, because that particular taste dominates everything. So for a while, it kind of all exploded and there's all kinds of interesting things going on and getting played. So it, it was a good time from that point of view. 
Uh, yeah, I liked I liked bits and pieces of it. Actually, you said yeah, it's it's kind of a, it was absorbed. <coughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Where there was nothing new. Uh, no, it's not so much that it, it there was nothing new because there was. You, you know, you come sort of mid eighties and slightly beyond. You got people like Nine Inch Nails beginning to to rear up. You know, and that was a huge leap forward in terms of what electronic music could do. Massive. You know, that was just amazing to me. What what they were what Trent was doing at that time, um, but it, it it became when all of these bands that were previously guitar based bands or whatever start adding keyboards even people like Queen uh, who used to write on their albums no synthesizers on this album even they started using synthesizers so it it it, it stopped becoming a, a little thing in its own right it just become accepted now people that were more dedicated um, you know sort of primarily or exclusively electronic but loads and loads of other people were using that same technology that weren't electronic so it kind of lost its uniqueness in a way, and I think that was a problem with it. There were there were still people around that were doing good stuff, but it was far harder, and more aggressive, and more exciting than um, sort of mainstream pop music of the day. So it didn't really get on radio, and it, and it struggled to to get to the masses the way that I had I had luckily because I, I was sort of very early on in it, and it, and I be, it, when I came along, it was knew and nobody had heard it before and I was lucky it just you know I had a couple of good TV appearances and it just captured a moment and I was away you know um, but yeah, some amazing music came out five or six years after that uh, genuinely amazing in my in my opinion which uh, in this country at least at the time didn't really strike a chord in the same way and so electronic music seemed to kind of founder but I mean you had things like Depeche Mode um, there, there were there were other things around, and it was massive, but it just it, it didn't have that new feel to it anymore. It was no longer you know something that nobody had ever heard before. People had now been hearing it for a number of years, and quite a lot of people were doing it, and a lot of other people were taking it on board and adding an element of it to their own music. So it just kind of lost its um, sparkle. Okay, uh, today your music has become a lot more industrial. Mm. Uh, was that also would it, would this have been an opportunity back in your early days to, to get more industrial? What did did you think of bands like Throbbing Grizzle or Cabaret Voltaire? I I I feel that with the whole when my own career has gone, that mid mid to late eighties, I was so disenchanted with the whole thing, and I got so obsessed almost about career rather than music, I, I missed a number of huge opportunities to kind of reinvent myself and to take my music into a different direction, which I did eventually, but probably eight, nine, ten years even later than I should have done and could have done. Um, so there are all these people, you know, your throbbing grosses, beginning to do genuinely exciting things with electronic music, um, and I just didn't hear it. I, missed it completely and I was completely absorbed by radio and career and trying to get back you see people talk about selling out people will say to you that you've sold out when you sell millions of records that's ridiculous you know you know you sell out when you start writing songs to be famous and that's what I did in the mid 80s I started writing songs for the sole object I'm trying to get back on the radio, I'm trying to get my career back on its feet again. And that was the worst moment for me, and that just got... I went more and more down until about 91, 92. Uh, and then I found what I should have been doing. Kind of stumbled across something that has been staring me in the face for the last five, six years or more. Have you ever had an encounter with uh, early rap music from the uh, early 80s or things like that? Hip hop culture, hip hop music? Anything uh, that's stuck in your mind? Uh, no. No, I've, no, I've met no dislike, like, or anything that you thought, what the hell is that? Or When I first heard rap, I, I was uh, kind of cool with it actually. I thought cause I had, there's some real good grooves going on underneath it. Um, and I, was, I thought it was good and, and quite exciting. Then it kind of be just become formulaic, and I and I think it's kind of been like that for 
for quite a while. So I lost interest in it, to be honest about it. Okay. And just a few names. Um, maybe they ring a bell over you. Uh, Duff, the German group, Duff, Deutsche mm -hmm. Amerikanische Freundschaft. Yeah, knew about them. Never bought anything, but the few things that I heard I liked. And uh, also Devo. Yeah, Devo. You know, I had a, I had a Devo moment, but it didn't last long. And apparently, I hung out with him in America for a bit. I got no memory of that whatsoever. So I don't know what I was doing, but I got no no memory. It just didn't happen in my world. Um, not really. No American version of what we were doing more seriously over here. Okay. And it was silly. I mean, it wasn't even that funny. <laughs> and bands like, let's say, Gang of Four, um, for example? Again, know of it, heard some stuff, okay. liked it, but didn't buy anything. Okay. What did I? Or do you have any anyone that you would like to say, wow, that was really, that had an impact on me that I don't have on my... I've got three things that have had a massive impact on me and shaped the music that I make. First one would be Ultravox with John Fox when I very first started. Middle years, um, two actually I suppose middle years really would, would be Nine Inch Nails for what they were doing and Songs of Faith and Devotion with Depeche Mode, pivotal album for me, changed everything. The way I thought, the reason for writing the sounds I was looking for, direction, stage, pre presentation, everything. Hugely important to me, so those three.